So for everyone, I want to welcome everyone to Amazing Cancer Conversation. And I talk about Bruce. He doesn't know it, but I talk about Bruce literally every single day. And he's kind of an idol of mine. And he's an icon of really, honestly, revolutionizing and transforming the future of health and humanity. Because he and I both feel that frequency is the future of medicine. And all of us are broadcasting frequencies every single day. Uh, Bruce wrote the book, uh, Biology of Blue B- Belief, and this was 2004 or wow. five, five. And then he wrote The Honeymoon Effect here and then Spontaneous Evolution. So I've had the pleasure um, of, of knowing about Bruce for a long time and uh I write for a magazine called What Your Doctors Don't Tell You, and I was dying to meet Bruce and had the opportunity to meet Bruce. So I'm going to let him do the talking because he is going to provide you with breakthrough information, how you can transform your life right now with the power of your thought. But I think it's always important to understand why everyone does what they do. And that's what drives them. So, you know, you got to tell your story, Bruce. (laughs) I I just have to say that I was in the right place at the right time without even knowing about it. I was cloning stem cells. Now, let's do things. What is a stem cell? The fact is, under your skin are 50 trillion cells. And every second, as you're watching the show, Every second, three and one half million cells are dying. Well, fortunately, uh, you stay uh, alive and you stay healthy because in your population of cells, there are the ones called stem cells. The original name for stem cell was embryonic cell, and they changed the name. So you have all these embryonic cells in your body, and their job is to replace the ones that are dying every second. And so what was I working with? population of what are called stem cells. And so I was working with embryonic cells. Now, here I am in a lab. Uh, I want you to understand, at the same time I was working on this, I was also teaching students uh, the understanding of uh, the DNA, RNA protein. It's called the central dogma in biology. And it's the story that genes are the source of life, and they unfold from DNA to making copies of the gene called RNA. And the RNA are blueprints to make the parts of the body. So um, the unfortunate understanding that came along with it is that information only flowed one way. It starts with the DNA, goes to the RNA, and then goes to the protein. But it doesn't go backwards. Well, immediately, the first thing you have to understand is this, you are the protein. And I say, so what does that mean? It says, well, you cannot send information back up the ladder, and therefore, uh, you cannot influence your genes. Your genes influence you. And uh, if we go through what I was teaching in hindsight, now looking at it differently, what I was teaching them was this. As far as you know, you didn't pick the genes you came with. If you don't like the characteristics, you can't change the genes. And then we added, and the genes turn on and off by themselves. And I go, so what does that leave us with? What is, put those together. And I say, what is the conclusion? And the conclusion is very simple, that we are controlled by our genes. It's called genetic determinism. It's the belief that uh, we have no power over our genetic activity, that they, they, the genes unfold as our life unfolds, okay? So we've been programmed with genes. And I'm teaching that. And in my lab, I'm growing these uh, stem cells, embryonic cells. Well, the other word was cloning stem cell. I said, what does that mean? Well, uh, instead of just throwing a bunch of cells in the Petri dish, I put one cell in the dish, just one cell. And it divides every 10 or 12 hours, okay? And the most important aspect of understanding this is that it doubles every 10 or 12 hours. So first there's one cell, then there's two cells, then there's four, then there's eight, 1632, boom, boom, boom. A week later, 30,000 cells in the Petri dish. But the point about cloning is this. All the cells came from the same parent. 
So I have 30,000 genetically identical cells. I say, so now what? I split the cells, 10,000 cells in each of three dishes. So 30,000 cells total, split them up, 10,000 in dish A, 10,000 in dish B, 10,000 in dish C, recognizing all the dishes, all the cells are genetically the same. We grow cells in something called culture medium. And I, I want to give you a surprise, but I don't want to, I can't wait for the surprise. I got to tell you what it means. Culture medium is the laboratory version of blood. Right. So I grow human cells. I say, what is human blood made out of? And then I mix that up in the laboratory and we call it growth medium. Well, since I'm creating a growth medium, I can change a few of the ingredients. So I do. I create three slightly different versions of culture medium. And they're almost the same, but quite different chemistry. I say, so what? Well, the culture medium is the environment in which the cells grow. Okay? Now I say, so what? Well, I'm creating the environment for the cells. And I have made three different ones. Let's call them A, B, and C. Uh, and I say, okay, in dish A, with environment A, <laughs> uh, the cells form muscle. In dish B, with a different environment B, the cells form bone. And in the third dish, with yet a different growth medium environment, the cells form fat cells. The question is, what controlled the fate of the cells? Well, they were all genetically the same. The only thing that was different was the environment. And at some point, I started to realize, wait a minute, the genes aren't controlling this. It's the environment that's controlling this. Well, this is a revolution because everything was genes top down. Now it's no environment going back up. And the environment adjusts our genetics. And this is completely the opposite of every basic education about genetics. Genetics, it goes from the genes down. This is from the environment up. And the point about it is simply this. The gene story that you heard, you're a victim. Your heredity is controlling your life because you got the genes and the genes are going to unfold and your life is going to be a printout of those genes. And then I go, well, here's an interesting fact now. It's the environment that the genes are in that determines the character of the genes. I go, well, what's neat? I say, you control the environment. You're not a victim. You unfortunately didn't know you were mastering your genetic activity with your environment. Well, it's really what's in between the environment and your cells, and I say the brain. I say, what does that mean? The brain reads the environment and then adjusts the cells to fit the perception of that environment. Now, I use the word perception for this reason. Two people can be in the exact same place and look at the exact same environment and see something totally different. And all of a sudden, I say, well, that's your perception that is controlling this, okay? So here's the point. In a plastic dish, the chemistry of the culture medium determines the fate and genetic activity of the cells. But you are a skin-covered Petri dish. Under your skin are 50 trillion cells, and you have the original culture medium. Blood is the original culture medium. I go, so what? It doesn't make a difference if the cells in the plastic dish or in the skin dish. It's still controlled by the environment, the blood. And I go, so why is that important? So I say, then, where or what controls the chemistry of the blood? Because that's what's going to control the fate of the cells. I go, the brain's the chemist. I go, great, the brain's the chemist. Now comes the most important question of everything I just led up to, and it is this. So what chemistry should the brain put into the blood? And here's what it's based on. Whatever consciousness you are seeing in your head, Something, a nice vision, a negative vision, scary vision. I say, why? The brain translates that vision into complementary chemistry. Meaning what? Well, if you have a picture of love in your mind, the brain releases some wonderful things into the blood. Oh, uh, oxytocin, the bond with your lover. Dopamine, mm -hmm. oh, 
That's pleasure. So when you're in love, you get the pleasure of the dopamine going through your body. Oxytocin bonding, another great uh, chemical coming from the brain of somebody in love is called growth hormone. Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's exactly what it says it is. It's hormone that enhances your growth and your vitality. And this is why when people fall in love, the picture of love releases a chemistry that bonds them to their lover, activates the excitement, and makes them healthy. Oh, people say, oh, look, see how in love they are. See how they glow. That glow is chemistry, my friend. Okay? So I say, well, that's a picture of love. What if you have a picture of fear? And I go, oh, you don't get love chemistry with fear. <laughs> you get stress chemistry with fear. I go, what's that? Well, stress hormones such as cortisol, norepinephrine, for example. And I go, what else? Well, you get factors that control the immune system, actually inhibit the immune system. And I say, so why is this important? I say, as you change your thoughts, you change the chemistry. As you change the chemistry, you change the genetics. And all of a sudden it says, oh my God, all these years you were programmed to believe you were a victim of your genes genetic determinism, it's 100% false, 100% false. And just while we're on the topic of it, just to, you know, liven it up a bit, there's not one gene that causes cancer. There is no gene. You have that gene, you get cancer. No. Even the BRCA gene, there's a large percentage, up to 50% in some cases, of, of women who have that gene and never get the cancer. I say, stop looking at the ones that got the cancer and start asking a question about how did the ones with the gene not get the cancer? That's the important point. Well, 23 years after I did the experiment, science came to the same conclusion that I had 23 years earlier. And that is, there's a new science that's called epigenetics. I go, oh, it sounds like genetics. I go, it's a revolution. I go, why? Epi means above. I go, well, wait, the old belief, this cancer is due to this gene. This gene causes this cancer, okay? Well, it's not a true statement. Genes don't cause anything. Genes are blueprints. They're there to make the body parts. And here comes the other important insight to this. Your mind takes a picture, the brain turns it into chemistry, and the right. chemistry goes to the cells, and it's the chemistry of the culture medium that determines the fate of the cells. It's now recognized that nine out of ten cancers are strictly due to lifestyle. And you go, so what? I go, you want to get rid of the cancer, you change the lifestyle. <laughs> you know, everyone says, let's kill the cancer cells. I go, well... They've been doing that for 30, 50, uh, 1930, okay? They've been doing that with what? Chemotherapy, radiation, same process all the time. Like, so what's the point? Well, they're killing the dividing cells because cancer cells divide fast. The stem cells also divide fast. And people haven't recognized over the years that when you do chemotherapy and radiation, you don't just kill the cancer cells, you also kill the stem cells, which are keeping you alive. So it's very threatening to do that for the body, okay? Now the question comes down to this. You're killing the cancer cell. It's already got the cancer. You can kill all the damn cancer cells you want. Does it answer how you got the cancer? Nope. And that's where the whole thing falls apart. You can kill cancer cells. Yep, I can give you the drugs and radiation. Will it stop cancer? No, it has nothing to do with it. Those cells already have the cancer. Nobody said, how did the damn cells get the cancer in the first place? Correct. Uh, and the issue is this. The chemistry it's, of the body. That's right, exactly. And so many patients come in on a regular basis. And of course, as you know, conventional medicine always ask, oh, what did your mom have? What did your dad have? And I'm worried because my mom had breast cancer, my whatever parent had something, heart disease yeah. or whatever. And they automatically think that, oh, they're going to get it. And so um, it's they, part of our- victim before it even started. Exactly, correct. And so, so many people think 
so many. So I I know that I talk about this in my, my book and everything that I teach that that really it's less than five percent, and you're saying really it's zero percent, correct? Yeah. Uh, 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 and and the whole issue is this: if you have a vision of cancer, remember what is the brain's function? Take the vision and turn it into chemistry that manifests your body to match the picture. If you're thinking love, your body is engaged with joy and happiness and open and take it all in. If you're engaged in fear, oh no, it closes itself down and is hiding because it needs to protect itself. If you're angry and you can't express that anger, the heat of that anger is what actually leads to the cancer. Now, a fact is this. So when you hear this fact, then I'm suddenly said, well, how did I get the cancer? You ready? They looked at the fate of what happened to children who are adopted into families where there's cancer running in the family. Guess what? The adopted child, as, as an infant, the adopted child will get the same family cancer as all the natural siblings. The adopted child came from totally different genetics. What was the point? Oh, wow. What was the point? It was the downloading of behavior. Programming. That, that whole thing. In the first seven years, actually three months before you're born, uh, you start downloading behavior. You say, why? Okay, for a list back up and make the simplest point. The brain is not like a computer. The brain is a computer. Most powerful computer humans have ever known is the human brain. But it has the same functionality. And I go, so why? I go, if you went in the old days, not today, and bought a new computer. You could bring it home, plug it in, push button, and the screen lights up, and you say, this computer is booted. I say, now do something. And you go, I can't. I say, get a brand new computer. You know, oh, first I have to install programs. Then I can access the computer. Well, let me tell you, people. The brain lights up first three months before you're born. It boots. And between three months before you're born and age seven, the system is designed to download programs. A child's brain is operating below consciousness level, predominantly in something called theta. Now, theta is imagination. So this is how kids under seven can mix the real world, the imaginary world, you know, uh, that famous tea party, pour nothing into the cup, drink the nothing. It was the best damn tea you ever had in your life. Uh, the broom is a horse, not a broom. I go, that's imagination. That's theta. Imaginary friends, theta. Mixing reality and imagination. But theta is hypnosis. I go, why, why should it be hypnosis? And the answer comes a simple point. You ready? How many rules do you have to learn to be a functional member of a family? Ah, how many rules do you have to learn to be a functional member of a community? Thousands, you know? You don't get on the bus and take your clothes off. That would be wrong, okay? How do you know that? Programming, okay? I go, so what's the point? You're being programmed for the first seven years, actually three months plus seven years. And this is how you get the computer off the ground. Consciousness kicks in after age seven, okay? So I say, where are these programs? I say, they're in the subconscious mind. You go, oh, well, that's the, the old mind. We have that new one right behind my forehead called the conscious mind. That's where we are in regard to our spirituality, our personal identity, our source, conscious mind. Subconscious minds, all kinds of programs, taking care of the system, beating your heart, breathing, you know, adjusting the chemistry, the temperature, doing all that stuff. Subconscious, below conscious. You don't know what's going on. It's running. Okay? I go, but the conscious mind is the one connected to your spirituality. It's the mind with the wishes and the desires. If I asked anybody, tell me what you want, the answer comes from the conscious mind. It's the creative mind. The subconscious mind is the habit mind. I go, so cool. First seven years, I put the programs in. After age seven, I got my hands on the keyboard. I'm putting in what I want into my computer and making my life. And I go, on paper, that sounds nice. In reality, that's completely wrong. I go, why? Because the conscious mind, which is creative, can do two things. 
It can be creative, have thoughts, imagination. Wow, wow, what do I want? But it also can think. What the heck does that mean? Thinking is looking inside for an answer. A thought is inside. If I ask you right now, I say, uh, can you tell me what you're doing on Sunday? It may not be written anywhere in your place someplace, but guess what? Stop and think about it. And on Sunday, oh, I said, where'd you get the answer? Inside. I go, why is that important? Because when you're thinking, you're not looking out. You're looking in. I said, oh, well then what if I'm driving my car and I'm thinking? I said, then you're not driving the car. What do you mean? Not your conscious mind, because your conscious mind's inside, so it's not even looking out the windshield. Yeah, but guess what? The subconscious mind, which is a million times more powerful computer, knows how to drive the car because it's a habit. So guess what? The moment you're thinking, you're not driving the car. The subconscious is driving the car. And then I say, now comes, now you got to really sit down and listen to this one. Because this is it, folks. How much time do we spend thinking? You ready? 95% of the day, our conscious mind is thinking. I go, so what? Well, if the conscious mind's thinking, it's not looking out the window. And I say, yeah, but what? I say, you have a life out there. You're driving your car. You're talking to people. You're doing your job. You have certain behaviors. That, well, I say, what? These are habits. So, oh, 5% of the day, you are actually using creative thinking consciousness to create your life five percent just five percent 95 percent of the day the subconscious is like autopilot meaning what when you're thinking and the conscious mind's not going inside subconscious steps in handles the vehicle drives you and i go so what's the point you think you're running your life with your wishes and desires five percent 95 percent your program and if your program, like most people's, is flawed, because our parents who were our programmers were flawed and passed that on, then cancer runs in a family, but not because it has anything to do with the genes. It has to do with the downloading of the program in the first seven years. How, how valuable is this? I love it because, oh, well, this must be new science. I go, well, it's basically new science, but guess what? 400 years, the Jesuits have known this and even told their followers, they would say, give me a child until it is seven and I will show you the man. I go, what does that mean? Let me program the first seven years and I will show you the outcome because that person will be 95% of, the, of their life, that program. So they knew we were programmable. Well, the Jesuits had nothing on today's programming when you see an infant that can hardly walk carrying an iPad, playing on a computer, you are actually watching intense programming. And I say, so what? And I go, the programs run the show 95% of the day. And I go, so what? And I say, most of those programs, 60%, disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting beliefs. And you go, yeah, but I would see if I was screwing up. I go, no, you see, you didn't get it. <laughs> When you're thinking and the program's playing, you're the one that can't see it, but everybody else does. So I, well, I, I, for 40 years, and Lee's probably heard this about a thousand times, but I'll do it again. You have a friend and you know your friend's behavior very well, and you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the same behavior as the parent. As you get so excited, you can't wait. Oh, oh, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. Back away from Bill. I can tell you what Bill already said. And Bill said, how can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. And people laugh because they have that experience. I go, what does that mean? It means when Bill is playing the program he downloaded from his dad, he's the one that can't see it. But everybody else saw it. And everybody else responded to it. And all of a sudden, but Bill never seeing he's even playing a negative program only looks at Oh, these people are nasty. These people interfere in my life. That person messed me up. This person did this. I go, they were responding to you, Bill, <laughs> because you didn't see what you were saying. Oh, oh, 
Dr. Connolly, can I add this most important fact at the end of this right here, right now? And the, and the, we are all Bill. Every day, you are playing programs 95% of the day. And those programs, most of them came to you before age seven. And if they're programs of harmony, then you got something good going. And if they're programs of stress, then you got something bad going. And there's even a book, Richard Kiyosaki wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. What was the point? If you grew up in a rich family, you grew up with the uh, storyline and the behavior and everything that made people rich. And you say rich. But if you grew up in the poor family, all you heard was life's hard, not easy, can't do it, we're not going to make it, not enough, blah, blah, blah. And then you stay poor. That's the basis of the book. Well, it's the basis of your life besides rich and poor. Health and happiness, joy. You know, how much happiness do you have? You know, how much health do you have? How much joy do you have to be on this planet? I go, what's this all about? And the answer is this. You are a creator. You are creating your life. Unfortunately, 95% of your creation is being done without you knowing what you're doing. <laughs> and all of a sudden it says, well, then what's the story of my life? I said, your program? And you go, but here's the point. You cannot tell me your program. I said, why not? Well, you were being programmed three months before you were born. What program did you get? Oh, come on, you know, you weren't there. Okay, wait, wait, you were programmed a whole year from zero to one. What program did you get when you were two months old? Okay, you were programmed another whole year from one to two. What program did you get when you were one year old? Okay, you were programmed another whole year from two to three, about three. You might have memories of something, okay? But below that, no. But they're the more fundamental programs. And the idea is this. You don't know your program, but you are creating it 95% of the day. And I said, well then, how can I know my programs? I just said, you are creating your programs 95% of the day because that's how much you're using the subconscious program. So I say, you want to know what your programs are? Right now, look at your life. The things that you like that come into your life, they come in because you have programs to acknowledge those things. Now, the things that you want and you struggle, you work hard, you sweat over it, you put a lot of effort into it, and you're working, I'm, I'm sweating over it, I'm going to make it work, I'm working real hard. Why are you working so hard? Whatever that destination you are seeking and you find it necessary to work hard to get there is because whatever that destination is, is not supported by your program. And your conscious mind wants to make it happen 5% of the day, and the subconscious mind is keep it happening 95% of the day. And where is the struggle? Right there. And the point about it is this. Let's just get down to the cancer or health story. Less, this is a real fact, right? Less than 1% of all the diseases on this planet are connected to genetics. 99% of disease has nothing to do with genetics and everything to do with lifestyle and consciousness. And I say, so why is that important? Because as Dr. Connolly has been helping you with all these months, is very simply this. You are a creator. You create the wonderful things in your life. And unfortunately, you're going to have to really recognize you're responsible for the things that aren't so nice. And that's not to punish you. That's to wake you up. I say, why? Because if you created something you don't want, you can change the creation. And all of a sudden, you can change it. But I say, how do you do it? Well, you have to believe it. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, listen, I'm a spiritual person, scientifically. Not church religion has nothing to do with it. I, I have a scientific foundation for recognizing the nature of spirituality, okay? That's how I became spiritual at that level. But the whole point about this is we are spiritual beings. We came here as creators, but we have been programmed to lose our power. Much of that programming occurred in the first seven years of your life, where you took the beliefs of others and made them your truth. This happens uh, uh, with clergy. It happens with doctors. I go, what does that mean? I say, 
Well, go back to before age seven. If your family had anybody get sick and they went to the doctor, what did you learn as a program? You ready? Well, if I'm sick, I don't know how to do it, but the doctor knows all about it. So whatever the doctor says is now my truth because I don't know, but the doctor knows. I go, well, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> I go, why? Because they don't understand that either. I go, why? Well, they give you a prognosis. And I say, what the hell does that mean? They're giving you a future, how something's going to unfold. I go, so what? I go, if you were part of that family under age seven, a prognosis is actually a prescription <laughs> that you have bought the truth from a subconscious program, subconscious, not conscious, subconscious program, said the words of that doctor are truth. And the subconscious will then manifest those words. Okay? And the point about it is why? Because your creative mind's only working 5% of the day, and the subconscious is working 95%, and the subconscious got the program. And you don't see it. And then all of a sudden, we become victims. I said, we're not victims. We're creators. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, wow. I said, well, what's so important? Because... 99% of illness has nothing to do with the genes. It has to do with the way we're living. 90% is straight out stress. We're living in a stress world. Stress shuts down the biology. I go, why would it do that? It's simple. Let's go back 100,000 years where the only damn thing that would stress you is that saber-toothed tiger that is chasing you right now. And I go, that's a threat. And I go, yeah. And I say, what happens when you're under threat? And the answer is you get ready to run. It's called fight or flight. It's called the adrenal system. I said, what's its function? Runs like hell. Okay, now, now I said, so what? I go, well, wait. Blood is the source of energy. That's where the energy is, okay? So what? I go, almost all the blood in your body is not through your arms and legs. It's running in your gut. All the blood vessels the lungs, the stomach, the pancreas, the kidneys, all these things. I said, what are they doing? Taking care of you. Maintenance of the body, cleaning, fixing, repairing. That's what your gut's doing. Yeah, but most of the blood's there. What if I'm being chased by a tiger? I said, oh, you need the, bloods in, the blood in your arms and legs. That's how you're going to get the energy to run. So, so well, how does the blood from the gut get to my arms and legs? Stress hormones squeeze the blood vessels in the gut shut. So as the blood is trying to pump through, it can't go through the viscera. It goes to the arms and legs. So you can use that to run, okay? When you're in fear, you feel that. It's called butterflies in the stomach. You know what that is? The blood vessels squeezing, fluttering. You can feel them fluttering. It's like, ooh, queasy. I feel queasy. I go, yeah, you're shutting down the blood supply to the gut so you can run. Okay, oh, okay. And so I say, so what's the first problem? When you're in stress, you shut off maintenance of the body. That's the first thing. Okay, why? Because the blood's not energizing and the blood's in the arms and legs now. Number two, ooh, wake up for this one. You ready? The immune system is designed to protect the interior environment of your body against viruses, bacteria, parasites, cancer cells, etc. I say, oh, well, the immune system is very important. I go, yeah, and it uses a lot of energy. Really? Yes. If you've been really sick, you probably didn't have the energy to get out of the bed. Okay? So now I say, now let's put ourselves back in that situation of running away from that saber-toothed tiger behind you. Yeah, we just conserved a lot of energy. Why? Because we shut down the blood vessels in the gut, got them in the arms and legs, ready to go. Yeah, but what if you have a bacterial infection? I say, oh, I have to use some of that energy for the immune system. I go, oh, yeah. So I say, oh, so if you have a comorbidity, meaning you have an issue before something shows up, your immune system is already being compromised, okay? But now listen to this. Stress hormones shut down the immune system. I go, why? If you're running from a saber-toothed tiger and you have a bacterial infection, who gives a damn about the bacteria? If the tiger gets you, you, you the bacterial infection is not your problem anymore. So what's the point? Don't waste your energy on the immune system. 
use it to run from the tiger. So stress hormones shut off the function of the me mechanism of maintenance of your body. Stress hormones shut down the immune system. And I like to add this because I, I refer to it as adding insult to injury. I say, what's that? Thinking is a very slow process <laughs> compared to the hind brain, which is reaction, reflexes, so fast you can't even see what you're doing, how fast it's going. The point is this. If you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, it's not time to think. Thinking is too slow. you got to react. you got to go. So remember I said the blood vessels in the gut, when the stress hormones come and squeeze them shut? The blood vessels in the forebrain, when the stress hormones are squeeze them shut to do what? Push the blood to the hindbrain where reflexes and reaction occur. So you become less intelligent. You become more victim when you're under stress because you can't think your way out of this one. I said, so what's the point? That whole system was designed to run away from a saber-toothed tiger. I go, so what? I said, if you make it 10 minutes of being in stress and you got away, no more saber-toothed tiger. And that's it. Now you come back to life again. Everything's okay. Good. Ten minutes. Big deal. Today's civilization is 24-7, 365 stress. We were never designed biologically to live a stressed environment. Stress hormones are so effective at shutting off the immune system. Listen, when doctors want to transplant an organ from person A to person B, and they don't want the recipient's immune system to reject the foreign tissue, they give the recipient of the graft stress hormones before the operation so that when the foreign tissue is implanted, the immune system is reduced its function. So I say, stress hormones are so good at shutting off the immune system that they use it therapeutically to shut down the immune system. So I said, put those pictures together. I say, genes don't cause anything. Genes are blueprints. I say, yeah, but the mind is going to adjust the body to the picture. And I go, yeah, and what's the picture? 24-7, 365, stress. Why? The world we're living in is, is a stress model. It's, it's not functional, actually. It's quite dysfunctional. <laughs> and it's falling apart, which is causing more stress. But this is what we're facing. And if you have an illness... The last thing you need is stress, for God's sakes. Why? Because your immune system is being reduced functionally. And all of a sudden I say, yeah, avoid the stress. Just go to the, uh, get, get a, uh, you know, a, a prognosis and tell me, did that reduce your stress? Not really. <laughs> did I just kill my cancer cells with, with radiation and chemotherapy? Yeah. Did I kill stem cells? Yeah, you killed some stem cells. Yeah. Did I cure cancer? No. Why? Those cells already had the cancer. You never stop where the cancer came from. Well, there's something wrong here, isn't there? And you're being offered an opportunity to make a change. Dr. Connolly's been here with you to try to help you make this change. You need to recognize, stop being the damn victim because you're the creator. You're the creator. And that takes me to my fun part. If I can continue, should I continue? Yes, you can. Okay. Well, my work was first I identified the nature of the new science. Oh, I never went back and said uh, about epigenetics. Uh, I got carried away. Let me just finish that little thought now that it came up. The idea of genes that you learned is genes control X, genes control cancer, genes control heart, blah, blah, blah. The new science is called epigenetics controls cancer. It sounds the same. Epi means above. I go, what do we call skin? Epidermis. I said, why do we call it that? Because just underneath the skin is the layer called dermis. And skin is above the dermis. So it's called epidermis, above, epi, above. I go, and what's the new science? Epigenetic control. What does that mean? Control, epi, above the genes. The mind is the architect. The genes are the blueprints. The mind can build anything with the genes that we have. And then recognize that your life is not coming from the genes. It's a manifestation of your consciousness. And that if you change consciousness, you change the character of your life. And yet you want to take drugs 
and they want to take chemistry. I go, that's down here. That's when everything is down here. Yeah, I got a cancer here, so I'm going to do something down here. I go, yeah, but where the hell did it start? Oh, it started up here. And all of a sudden, you have to recognize. You can try to deal with it down here, but you're not dealing with the source. The source of the problem is the mind and consciousness and programming. And then uh, I, 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 there's a such a beautiful side to this, and I mentioned it before. I said I was, I was spiritual, not religious. I didn't get there for that. I said, how did I get there? Well, if I tried to put my lungs, let's say, into Dr. Connolly, her immune system will say, not self, and destroy the graft. If she tried to put her kidney into my body, my immune system will say, not self, and destroy the graft. Oh, well, there's some very interesting information there. I said, what? The self can be identified as being different than others because uh, the immune system recognizes yourself but can identify any other self that's not you. I said, well, how does the immune system know where self is? The immune system reads physical things, viruses, bacteria, <laughs> parasites, cancer cells. So I said, well, what is the immune system seeing that makes your cells different than my cells? I go, and this is, this is the wake-up call when I understood the mechanism. The membrane of the cell has antennas, like TV antennas, but they're called receptors. Receivers, receptor, receiver. There's a large number of these receptors sticking off the surface of the cell. They're on the outer surface, antennas. I go, what is their function? Receiving. I go, yeah, but what do they receive? identity. What do you mean? These receptors are what the immune system is saying why you're different than everybody else. Yeah, but the receptors function is to read a signal. I go, so what? They're self-receptors. That's the name. Receivers of self. Where are they located? On the outside of the cell. Well, then where is the signal coming from that my receptors are reading outside the cell. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh my God, what makes you different? There are no two people in the entire world that have the same set of self-receptors. No two people in the whole world. Your set of receptors, yours only. I say, yeah, but what do they do? They download a signal. I go, what's the signal? Self. I go, wait a minute. Myself, Bruce, is not in here. No, Bruce is the broadcast that my receptors are picking up. Now, Dr. Connolly has her own receptors, and she's picking up her broadcast, and you have your own receptors, and you're picking up your broadcast, but nobody else is picking up your broadcast. I go, what do you mean broadcast? I go, there's an energy field. Wherever you're sitting right now, there are cell phone signals going through your room, television signals, radio signals, even solar energy signals. They're going through your room right now, invisible. It's called the field. Well, there's a field for human energy that humans share a, a, a broadcast band. I say broadcast band. You know, like the radio, if you still have one, you know, where you turn the dial, uh, mm -hmm. and then you get a station, then you get another station, then you get another station. Frequency. Each of us is receiving our own frequency station. I go, so what? I go, when you get it, it's going to blow your mind. I go, why? Your identity is not in here. It's playing through here. I mean, uh, to give you the simplest understanding, you ready? Your body is a television set, and the broadcast is your spirit. Right now, you're watching the Bruce show on the Bruce television. I go, so what? I go, what if you're watching the TV and it breaks and we say TV is dead? And I go, yep, TV is dead. Doesn't work anymore. TV gone. Did the broadcast die? The broadcast's not in the TV. It comes to the TV. Okay? And all of a sudden I say, well, wait a minute. You can't die. Why? You're not in here. You are the broadcast. And it's always here. You're just the receiver right now of that broadcast because you have the station tuned. And I say, then what? 
and this is all scientific, folks. <laughs> if your television breaks, your broadcast still here. I go, yeah. yeah. What if an embryo in the future shows up with the very same set of antennas? You're back in a new TV. Does it make a difference if it's male or female? No, that's the TV. That's not the broadcast. Does it make a difference if it's white, brown, black, red, yellow? I go, no, that's the TV. We are not the TV. We are the broadcast. And then you say, well, why, why should we come into these bodies? Virtual reality suit. I go, what do you mean? A spirit is an energy frequency. But to see a sunset, you need eyes. And eyes pick out the frequency of the light and then make pictures out of it, okay? You want to smell something? You need the, the frequency of the smell. Uh, and I said, what does the brain do? Whatever the receptors are, sight, sound, smell, sound, taste, the information is sent to the brain as a vibration. No picture in your brain of what you see with your eyes. It's all a field of vibration. I go, what? Well, we used to say, so many people do is, oh, your thoughts are in your head. I go, what do you mean? Because I can put wires on your head, and it's called electroencephalograph. And I'm reading your brain function. Everybody goes, yeah, inside my head, my thoughts are there. Guess what? There's a newer device called, not electroencephalograph, it's called magnetoencephalograph, M-E-G. And guess what? The probe that reads your brain is out here. I go, what does that mean? Not only are you receiving signals, you're broadcasting signals. And some of that signal goes back to self. And you have an experience. If you never felt love, but it was a theoretical thing, I could write you a theoretical meaning of love. But if you never had a body, you would never know what love feels like. This gives us sensation. Smells and tastes and pictures and sounds and warm and cold and all. It's, wow, this is great. But you have to recognize you are the driver. You are coming in and you are going into this conscious brain right here, which is the control room. And your thoughts are going to change their genetics based on whatever thoughts you are manifesting. Why? You are creating this life. And if you look at your life, Right now, like most people, you go, boy, this is a scary thing going on here. What the hell is going on? This world's upside down. It's crazy people, everything. I go, oh, remember I talked about programming? That's the program. You've been programmed. You're not creating your wishes and desires. You're creating from your program. And 95% of your life is coming from the program. So I say, well, then you're not finding heaven. I go, why not? Because... You were programmed not to. I go, but guess what? Many of you have seen the movie The Matrix. I go, so what? It's called science fiction. I go, nope, The Matrix is a documentary. What? Yeah, so what's the premise? The premise of The Matrix is we're all programmed. I go, well, that's scientifically valid. We're all programmed for seven years. That's, that's biology. That's parenting. That's the whole damn thing. I go, so what? In the movie, they had a chance where you could take two pills, either a blue pill or a red pill. I go, oh, what was that about? Well, if you take the blue pill, when you wake up in the morning, you're back in the same world you're in every day. But if you take the red pill, you get out of the program. Out of the program? What does that mean? Okay, you ready? Almost every one of you out here right now is taking that red pill once at least, if not more. You've taken the red pill, and you got out of the program. What happened? You fell in love. Science has recognized when you fall in love, you stay mindful. You stay present. You're not thinking anymore. You're being now. I go, so what does that mean? Well, guess what? If you're not thinking, you're not playing the program. And then what? Well, if you're running the show with your conscious mind, that's a creative one. Then what? What'd you manifest? Heaven on earth. You manifested a honeymoon. I go, you did that. No accident, folks. That was personal creation. And then you lost it because when thinking came back into the game, you started playing the programs. And unfortunately, in your honeymoon, your partner never saw those negative programs because you never played them. But once they start showing up, man, 
There's a monkey wrench in the system. 50% of marriages fall apart. Why? They marry the conscious mind person, but they are not intend to marry the subconscious program that goes with that person. And the idea is about the subconscious program can give you health. It can give you love. It can create the best job in the world. It can give you the joy and happiness and gratitude of being alive on this planet. I go, why? And now comes my final thing and then you can grill me, but I want to tell you the final thing. <laughs> You've been programmed to believe that if you have a really good life and then you die, you can go to heaven. I go, got it wrong, folks. You were born into heaven. Mm -hmm. This is your place of creation. Each one of you is creating your life. Now, when you look at it, you might be very upset and not want to acknowledge it. But the truth is, you didn't know you were creating from a program. How did you know? Because nobody ever told you. And the idea is now is the time to wake up because the world's in a desperate situation where you need to have your creative skills at your fingertips. And then start listening to the program. Start listening to Dr. Connolly. I mean, she's been trying to give you the advice of how to get from where you are to where you want to go. And the idea is what? Are you living your life or are you living your program? And I can assure you almost everybody out there is already living their program and don't even know it. And that is the part where trouble comes from. You don't know when you're playing the program because you're not paying attention and that's why you are playing the program. And so look at your life, all the wonderful things, programs there for support, all the things you want and you struggle, programs not supporting that and that's why you're working hard. Can you change the program? Yes, but that's another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so so why don't you tell all the people listening here, abroad internet and the people that are going to listen, like what in your own life, what catapulted you to change yourself? Well, the first thing is this. My science came to my head and I saw it. I saw it in the cells. I saw how the environment was controlling them. I learned the mechanism by how the environmental signals control the inside of the cell through the skin of the cell, uh, which is a computer chip. <laughs> and the significance about that was all of a sudden said, oh, my God, it makes an understanding of how we created this life, that we, that we were not genetically disposed to have all the problems on this planet. That's created from bad programming, okay? We came here to have what? Heaven on Earth. Have you experienced it? Probably at least once <laughs> uh, in your lifetime there was period. May Did it only last a few days? Well, that's sometimes when the, all the programs show up. and Or it could last a week, a month, a year. I happen to be on the long-term plan right now. 29 years of living heaven on earth. Why? I know the mechanism. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm not keeping it a secret. I keep trying to tell people. And a lot of people have taken this power back because you have to let go of the belief systems that have programmed you to lose your power. You are in charge of your health. You control your genes. You control the behavior that comes from your life and the behavior that comes back to you from your life. You are in charge. But if you claim victim, then you're claiming powerless. And if you claim victim and you claim powerless, then you have given up your power because you say i can't do it and i go you created it you can uncreate anything you can do all this you are the creator and the point that i got to was you don't die and go to heaven you came here to create that honeymoon every day of your life every day to wake up in joy and excitement and wonder what's going to happen today how beautiful can i think of something today how can i have a wake up and love every I always like to wake up and love every stinking day. No, I love my life. Did I know about it? When did I know about it? Not through the science. That gave me the mechanism. You know what made me know about it? I wanted to tell other people. So I'd gather a bunch of people together and say, I want to tell you the mechanism by how you create this life so you can create the most fabulous life. And then they look at me and they go for well, let them for a guy who says, you know this, your life doesn't look that good. And I realized, oh my God, I'm talking the talk. I'm not walking the talk. 
That was the wake up call. If this works, then why the hell am I not using it besides telling people about it? And I was kind of nervous because I thought, my God, I've changed the whole career to tell people about this. And what if it doesn't work? I'll lose my last job here. It worked. It worked so damn fast, it still surprises me how fast. All you had to know is know it and then do it. And and the point about it is most people have no belief in this because the, their life is, I'm a victim. You know, I, I had some good positive thoughts. Never happened. Well, you have to understand, those good positive thoughts are about 5% of the day. 95% of the day, you're not coming from good positive thoughts. You're coming from the program. It's the program that carries the disease. 90% of heart attacks, 90% of cancer, all lifestyle, just simple as that. 100%. Diabetes type 2, 100% lifestyle. Even something like uh, uh, multiple sclerosis. It's an autoimmune disease. That means, and take the Latin out of it, it means self-destructive. And people have been programmed to believe that that is a, a pathway to death. Rather than giving the encouragement, you can change your consciousness and get out of it. Because people do it all the time. But it's not part of our, our regimen. No, it's not part yeah. of conventional medicine at all. No, uh, uh, and I, was, I want to add this because then it sounds like, well, I'm I'm talking down on docs, and I go, no, doctors were my students. It's the teaching that screwed them up, not right. the doctors. It's right. the programming of medical school. I'm sure Dr. Connolly came in like so many students. Hey, first day of medical school. I'm coming in. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to save the world. I'm going to help people. Fourth year of medical school. Get me the hell out of this place because it was <laughs> grinding into them programs. No thinking. Here's the drug for this. Here's the drug for that. And then they push them out on the street. And it's like, what do you expect? <laughs> It's the damn programming of medical school. I go, I'm, I'm going to say it anyway. I don't care what people are thinking. That's because since I was a professor in the medical school, I have some insight. And the answer is this. The curriculum is controlled. It's controlled by the pharmaceutical industry. Why? If you can heal yourself without a drug, it's not being taught in the medical school. Why? It's an arm of the pharmaceutical industry, which has all the money. And they pay everybody. <laughs> <laughs> for this. Right. So the curriculum in medical school isn't medical curriculum, it's pharmaceutical curriculum. Which drug for which thing? And uh, the doctors get blamed, but they're the ones that were taught to say which drug for which thing. And we never asked them to think. We just told them what they should know. That is right. That's called indoctrination. Right. So we have a lot of questions. So um, let's let me pull this chat right here. Um, uh oh. Um, what do I get? Okay, so um, we're gonna. I'm gonna. Um. So one of the patients says, um, "I know we're gonna wait till this in the end because." Because somebody said, okay, would love to hear more about applying this to our lives, but we'll do that at the very end. So someone brought up about type 1 diabetes. It's kind of interesting. And you said type 2 is 100% lifestyle, which I would agree with you. About type 1 diabetes. Type 1 is a, a genetic issue, but guess what? Epigenetics can change the readout of a gene. We used to think a gene was a straight blueprint. You read the gene, you make the protein, that's what you get. Epigenetics is like uh, uh, taking a gene blueprint, which is like a strip with a code, with a pair of scissors and tape, where you can cut the, the blueprint and put it back together in different sequences. You can make over 3,000 different proteins from the same gene blueprint based on how you see the world. Epigenetics adjust the genes to match how you see the world. And basically, then all of a sudden it says, you've been blaming things on, on the genes. that the, the genes had nothing to do with that. Genes cannot turn it on and off. 
And Jane, you don't change the gene with epigenetics, you change the readout of the gene. The RNA is what's changed. So you Expression. can have a mutant right. gene, you can have a mutant right. gene uh, and change the RNA so it's healthy. Or you can have a healthy gene, that's the bigger problem. You can have a healthy gene and change the RNA so it's a mutant gene. And that's where most of the illness of this planet is coming from. Right. And it's some one of the listeners talked about like how do we deal with all the toxicity in our world? <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, let, let me let me bring this up because it's a mis a misunderstanding, a, a misperception. When you put something in your mouth and swallow it and it goes down through your intestine and stomach and all that stuff, it's not in your body. What do you mean? It's a pipe. It's a pipe where you could look down the pipe. And I go, why is that important? The pipe has a wall all the way down. Wherever it is, there's a wall until it comes out the anus. If you could stretch it out, you could shine a flashlight at this end of the pipe and see it come out the other end of the pipe. And so what was the point? Anything in the pipe is not in the body. It has to go across the pipe. Then it gets into the body. And the idea is, well, what crosses the pipe? I say, what are you trying to make? You're making a healthy body? Making an unhealthy body? What do you mean, healthy, unhealthy? I say, what program did you get about health and vitality? Why? Because it will determine what comes out of the pipe. You can drink strychnine poison with the right belief system, and it will never poison you because it will never come through the pipe. It will just go out the other end. And the point about that is people do that. I mean, I'm, I'm saying that because that's a practice down in the South in the U.S., where people drink strychnine to testify that God protects them. Really, it's their consciousness that says, I believe that I'm protected, and therefore I drink the strychnine, and it doesn't bother me. Why? Because it just goes out the other end, okay? So number one, if I put toxic stuff into my body, is it in my body when I eat it? I go, not yet. It has to be across the wall of the body. That's called absorption. And to be absorbed, it has to, the body has intelligence. To absorb what? What are you trying to build? You want to build a healthy body? Oh, then healthy stuff will come across. You want to get a weak body? Well, you can put garbage in there and it'll come across too. It's you are the creator of this thing. Again, it comes down to this. What are you trying to create with your life? And so uh, toxic things on the outside. Well, what about, uh, I mean, toxic things coming in from outside. But what about toxic energy? I go, ah, this is the cool one. I go, why? Remember I told you I could read your broadcast with the MEG probe? I could read your brain function? You're broadcasting a frequency? Well, there's something called cancellation frequencies, where certain vibrations coming in, I can send out a vibration that will cancel that vibration, called destructive interference. Or I can enhance a vibration, that's called constructive interference. So waves are coming to me, I'm sending waves out. With my waves, I can cancel these waves. Or I can enhance those waves based on what? My thoughts. And all of a sudden, you start to realize, well, 5G, and I go, yeah, but 5G doesn't come in. If, you, if your thoughts can cancel the 5G, of course they can cancel it. You know, what was the point? You were given such great powers and believe you're such victims <laughs> that you can't access these powers because your mind says, I don't believe it. I, look, I'm not a religious guy. I'm a spiritual guy, okay? Let's get that straight right now. I didn't get my awakening through a temple, a church, a mosque, or nothing. I got my awakening in a Petri dish looking at cells, okay? And I say, so why is it important? There's some wonderful things that Jesus said that nobody's paying attention to. I go, like what? I'll give you one right now, brother, you can, ladies and gentlemen. Here it is. All the miracles that I can do, you can do them better than I can. But you don't believe it. And that's the story of biology belief, folks. Belief is the miracle. <laughs> you don't believe it, you can't do it. <laughs> and therefore, you have been programmed to see you are a victim. Oh, you can't do that. Who do you think you are? You're not that smart. Who do you, you know, you don't deserve this. And those are parental uh, quotes <laughs> that were downloaded into you as parents were thinking they were going to help you by being the coach. You could do better. Who do you think you are? And I go, a child under seven is not conscious. It's in record. So if you were in a family and, and you got those things like, you don't deserve this. Who do you think you are? 
um, you downloaded that. You didn't think it because there was no consciousness. You just recorded it. Now 95% of your life is coming from that. So if you grew up with a, you see, it's a takeoff on something that is wrong. And I go, what is it? Well, a coach on a sports team has a player that's not doing well. Do you think the coach goes up and go, oh, please do better? No, the coach isn't going to say that. Coach, that's not good enough. You want to stay in this team? You don't even deserve to be on this team the way you're playing. Not good enough. A player on a team is old enough and has consciousness and recognize, oh, the coach is criticizing my behavior, so I will work harder. I go, great. If the parent acts as a coach, doing what he thinks the coach is doing, but his child is under seven, he's failing a very important insight. I said, what is it? Child's not conscious, just recording what you said. I'm not good enough. I'm not deserving. I'm not worthy. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And I go, what? Downloaded program in your subconscious. Oh, working 95% of the day against you. Oh, without you seeing, you're sabotaging yourself because you play the programs when you're not paying attention. Bottom line, story of life, cancer, heart disease, diabetes. It started here, where it started. And it's all consciousness and energy. <laughs> uh, 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 consciousness is energy. But this device, this virtual reality suit is magnificent. And you haven't even given it the credit that it's worth. And I say, what? It can see. It can see a sunset. It can smell that flower. It can taste that wonderful piece of cake. It, it, it can hear this beautiful symphony. I go, oh, you know what? That's all a result of cells translating environmental signals into vibrational frequencies that it sends to the brain. The brain doesn't have a sense of smell. It has a sense of vibration of smell. Okay? So what was the point? Why are you here? And the answer is to create what? Heaven. Heaven. And when you were doing it without realizing it, it was the greatest thing in the whole world. It's called the honeymoon. Honeymoon was like, go back if you have that memory. The joy. They can't wait to wake up and have more time to be here, to do stuff, to play. We're lost. We're in a, in a struggle world, and Charlie Darwin has a lot to do with that because he said evolution is based on a struggle for the survival of the fittest in the struggle for life. That was what it is. And ever since then, we've been struggling, and the idea was that was wrong. We never came here to struggle. We came here to create. And unfortunately, those that have had a program us have programmed us. And in that programming, we feel that we are victims when in fact, we are creators. And there's a wake-up call coming on this planet right now and creators have to start waking up right now. Why? We're destroying the environment. We came from the environment. If the environment doesn't exist, neither do we. And the earth is giving us a chance. It says, you got 20 years to get this together. Scientists from NASA have calculated that. That we, and look at the, the headline written, we are facing an irreversible collapse of civilization within the next 20 years. I go, that's why you see all the chaos. It's not working, folks. And the stresses are going to get more. Well, if the stresses are going to get more, you're going to get sicker. Unless you what? Detach from the stress. <laughs> Don't watch that stupid news. Why? I, I call it having an energy checkbook. I go, what the hell is that? I go, well, you have a checkbook that has your bank account to it, right? I go, yeah. I say, do you write checks for no reason at all? Oh, Dr. Kahn, I love your long hair. Let me give you a check for $5. You don't do stuff like that. Why? It's your money. Your money is your energy. Your energy is your life. You don't give it away. Except when it comes to energy, energy, you give it away. I say, energy runs, life is energy. You have energy, you got life. You got no energy, you surely don't have life. 
I go, what? You give away your energy to things that you have no influence over. But because, well, we all do it. And I go, I don't care what the hell they're doing. I'm not giving away my energy because it's my life. So I said, what if I give you an energy checkbook? They said, before you commit to doing something, which requires energy, because everything you do requires energy, before you commit to doing something, the question is this. Stop and say, what am I getting back? What is my family getting back? What is my community getting back if I engage in this? And you're going to start to find how many things you give up your energy for that if you start cutting those strings, you'll start to realize how much energy you have for yourself because you forgot about yourself. You're all workers and doers and nobody's being. We're working. What's next? Tell me where am I? Oh, I got to do this. That's next, next. I blah, 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 blah. I say, when was the last time you stopped and watched the sunset? I mean, it's like people go, what? I say, I lived in the Caribbean for a while. Everybody in the Caribbean. At sunset time, you don't do work. You sit outside. You watch the sun go down. You contemplate. You meditate. You stop the world. You watch. And I say, and who's watching the sunset here? Well, I saw it when I was going down the freeway when I looked at it. The light came in, so I put a blinder on. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I go, are you enjoying this place? Are you working? I started to recognize I can do both. But my working has to make me feel good when I do my work. I don't go to work going, oh, God, I got to go to work. <laughs> if you're doing that, what are you telling yourself? You don't like this. And that means you're going to affect the longevity you have on this planet. That's another whole story. <laughs> I can't get into it, Dr. Connolly, but it's the telomere story. And it determines how long your life is going to be. And there's an enzyme that can make telomeres. And the longer the telomere, the longer your life, okay? And the enzyme can work or not work. If it doesn't work, then your life gets short. If it does work, it can make your life long. I say, so what's the difference? How much do you love your life? How much do you wait to wake up and go, God, I got another day here. I'm going to do this. I love doing this. I love my job. I love my friends. I love this. I can't wait. I have great gratitude. I have a job. I have things. I'm busy. I have a life. And I go, and what about the other people? Oh, life's hard. It's tough. You know, I had some PTSD and, and I had some problems here with my growing up. My family used to abuse me and this and that. And I don't like this and I don't want my job. And nobody loves me. I go, those are things that shut off the enzyme. The enzyme is strictly based. You want more or less life. That's what the enzyme is based on. Those things that say, I can't wait for tomorrow are things that extend your telomeres. Those things like, oh, God, I have to go through that, will stop your telomeres. Where did it come from? Consciousness. What does consciousness do? Here we go again. It's translated into chemistry that controls the biology and genetics. <laughs> it's like, so you better be careful what you're thinking. So true. And this is what I... You know, with every single patient every day, because when you see cancer patients, the doctors never ask them, what are their goals? Okay, what is it that you want to do with your life? Because they are the CEO of the mind that controls the body. And so, <laughs> yes, and so so much uh you know it was interesting i did a post on how what you hear with cancer patients all the time is they had some incredibly stressful event or events and all of them will say it and especially if you give them the floor and the opportunity to speak and no one has ever asked them how are you doing and how are you living and thinking every single day? Do you believe that you're limitless, invincible, unstoppable? And you have to give them the permission that they can be that being. Absolutely, because we're programmed to be lucky. Oh, it's working, I feel so lucky. I said, what do you mean you feel lucky? That's the way it's supposed to be every day. I don't know what's going on here. you know. And it becomes very critical because it says, 
You're putting up with this because you have no consciousness that nobody taught you. And, and, and there are words that come in here that we cannot use anymore. Blame, shame, okay, guilt. Why? Those are based, every one of those is based on if you knew how everything worked and you decided not to follow the rules, then you are guilty. Then you should be blamed. Then you should have shame. If you didn't know how it worked, how can you follow the rules? You don't even know what the rules are. So how can you be guilty? Nobody ever told you how to do it. How can you be ashamed? No one ever told you what you were doing was doing anything. No one ever gave you that awareness. Ignorance means you cannot blame yourself for anything. Cancer. You can't get blamed. Yes, you're involved with causing it, but no one ever gave you the information of how you got it, why you got it, how you can change that before it goes anywhere. And if they didn't give you that information, how can you blame yourself? Because blaming yourself is a very terrible thing. Because it's not going to make anything get better. It's going to make everything get worse. That's basically what the problem is. And so the idea is that I feel so, I got cancer. I feel so ashamed. I go, well, for what? Well, I got cancer. I go, yeah? Yeah, but I created the cancer. I go, yeah, so? I go, yeah, but you didn't know you were doing it. No one ever told you. You never got the instruction book of how this thing works. And if you don't know how it works, how can you be blamed for something you no one gave you that education? And all of a sudden it says, please, yes, we are responsible for these issues. And why is that important? Because if you own responsibility, you can do something about it. If you claim you're a victim, then you're claiming, I have, I have no power. I go, what do you mean you have no power? You're a creator. Yeah, but I wouldn't have created this. I say, not in your conscious mind. But in your program mind, yeah, sure as hell, you know. And and there's something that that it, it, it implies it very interestingly to this. Again, I'm not religious, but when Jesus was being crucified, one of the last things he said, and this is going to make sense now. Forgive them; they know not what they do. I go, what does that mean? I go, someone fall, you know, gives you trouble. I say, did their spirit give you trouble? Or did their program give you trouble? I said, what's the difference? The spirit doesn't know the program's playing. They don't know what they do. <laughs> so can I blame their spirit and say, you got the evil spirit? I go, no, you got an evil program. That's not the spirit. <laughs> it's the program, okay? And so what was he saying? He says, recognize when people do you no good, people are bad, should we blame them? No. It's actually their program. They don't even know they have it. They got it downloaded from whatever, and they don't even know it. But does it mean you have to be with them and be nice because they're bad but don't know it? And I go, no, no. You just have to recognize their spirit didn't do this. Their program did it. And then get away from them. <laughs> don't hang around them. That would be silly. But don't, right. don't, don't get the evil on them. Right, because yeah, you that doesn't you're eating drinking the poison if you do. <laughs> right. So let's um since everyone now is so uh, you know vibrationally higher as of this conversation, what can they do right this second, Dr. Ah. Lipton, to really start catapult their life to that magical heavenly thinking? <laughs> Uh, this reminds me of a show when I was younger on TV. It was called The Bob Newhart Show, and he played a psychologist. And I loved it because no matter who the patient was, I walked in the room and sat on the other side of the desk and started giving him a story about the miserable life they would have. And right in the middle of their conversation about how miserable, he would just say, stop it, just stop it. In <laughs> fact, that is the key. <laughs> and I go, how do I know that? Because I had a personal experience. That blew my mind. And what was it? I said, look, I was uh, working in my lab, and I spent a whole day doing an experiment that three times during the day it failed. It takes three hours to set up the experiment. So nine hours of my day was setting up the experiment, and it failed three times in a row. And at the end of that day, I sat there with like a parent on my shoulder going, you can't do anything right. What's wrong with you? You know, you're so stupid, blah, blah, blah. I'm hearing this program playing, right? 
I'm in the lab alone. And there's a voice right out there. Nobody's here, but the voice is right there. And I'll never forget it as long as the voice said, don't you have anything better to do than to listen to this crap? And it stopped me at first because it was like, huh? <laughs> and then my I answered the question, yeah, I'd rather go see a movie. There was a newspaper. I picked up that newspaper, picked out a movie, went to that movie. Two hours later, I walked out. No depression, no anger, no nothing. Why? I stopped, I stopped it. I stopped it. The next time I started, because I could have been more, more like manic depressive, being the happy guy and then going down. And when I start going down, I would really go. And the second time I started going down after that, I started to go down a little bit. And all of a sudden, I remembered. I started to laugh. Don't I have anything better to do than listen to this crap? Yeah, do it. <laughs> and I did it. And I think it happened three times. And I'm going to tell you something, because it, for me, it's, it wasn't my life, and it is my life. For over 30 years, I have not been angry. Why? Why should I be angry? <laughs> they said, well, everybody did these wrong things. I go, let it go. Because if I sit here and stew on it, I'm keeping it here. It doesn't go away if I keep thinking about it. Because if I'm thinking about it, I'm bringing it into the field. Why? I'm broadcasting a vibration that will attract that whatever I'm looking for. If I'm looking for something to scare me, I'm afraid, there'll be reason for you to be afraid coming up. Okay? Why? You're broadcasting your life experiences and uh, your life is being created through those thoughts. And all of a sudden it says, what do you got to do? Just stop it. You can't change the world. Take an energy checkbook. Realize, have a political argument with your neighbor. And you get all heated up. And I go, man, we got... And then you walk away and I say... So, did you change anything? No. Did you use a lot of energy? Yeah. Did you get heated? Yeah. Well, heat is wasted energy. And you just wasted your life doing that. And you start to recognize, what things am I doing that I'm not getting something back for? Persecuting yourself. Stop that. Stop that. That was a program. Your coach parent put that program into you when they were coaching you when you were under seven. But you have to be conscious enough to see what you're doing. That's the hardest part because most people are not conscious of it. They're just doing it, doing it, doing it without even seeing what they're doing. And if it's negative, they don't see that, except it comes back and they see that part of it. You are a creator. You are a lover. Ready? You are a piece of God. No one can separate you from that piece of God. You can't separate yourself from that piece of God. I go, why is that important? Because somebody wants to try to sell you God? Turn around and say, I am. What? I am creating. And it's my creation, so get out of here. <laughs> you the know, I, I had a young couple... Uh, today and he has stage four testicular cancer and I was talking to them about what we're talking about right now because they have a two and a half year old and a four and a half year old and uh, about a month or so ago I wrote a piece on how to, how to have intentionality when you're going to have a child and what are your intentions with that child and so they asked me today and I promised I'd ask them and is that you know, you've had children, I've had children. And fortunately, I was very mindful because it wasn't easy for me to have children. And my, I thought it was more miraculous that I have children anyway. And so how would you, because I think, you know, the children of today need to have the right programs. And what would you tell a young parent today? everything that they can do yeah the most important thing you can do with an infant and this is an infant that was just born just in diapers and in, in, in your arms that little one from there on you think they're not listening their mind is downloading it's in theta theta is hypnosis 
You think they're not listening? Well, they may not understand it, but the program is downloaded, and when they get the knowledge, that program will make sense. And the idea is what? Well, then if you're talking to a child, never give them a negative thing. It's always positive. Well, you're the most wonderful child. You're so powerful. You can do anything you want. You're a creator. You, you, you can make life the way you want it to be. You're beautiful. You're lovely. Saying all these very positive things because they're going to depend on their program. That's a damn good start program right there. I agree. They feel good to themselves. We have trouble, us, our age. Why? Because we have parents that thought they were coaches and criticized us with the belief that their criticism is going to make us better without recognizing if the child's under seven, they're not even conscious of it. They're just downloading what you said. Uh, and it's very hard. Oh, I'm going to be a conscious parent. I go, how much of the day are you conscious? 5%. Then what the hell kind of parent are you when it's not the 5%? I say, you're downloading exactly what you got downloaded from your parents because that was a program. And you're passing that program on generation after generation to the same thing. We're passing programs on. I gave a lecture in, uh, in Tel Aviv, Israel, and we brought in uh, so uh, 300 Palestinians, uh, we got buses and brought them in. They've never even been in Israel. And in this big amphitheater at the university, there was Palestinians on one side, Israelis on the other side. I came through, the, gave them the technical story of uh, parenting and programming and all that kind of stuff like that. Uh, about how it works, okay? And, and then I'll never forget it because I have a slide and it's black except for white writing on the top. It said, the problem. And when I pushed the advance, two pictures came up. Two pictures. One, Israeli children playing with machine guns. Picture number two, Palestinian kids dressed up in military uniform carrying guns. I said, this is your problem. You are programming these kids under seven years of age to hate each other. They don't even know each other, but through your indoctrination, they will have subconscious programs where they will hate the other person and, and they won't even know them until they meet one. And the day they meet one, it's, oh, you're the one I hate. And the whole idea about it is what? I said, you have created this whole damn thing going here in the Middle East right now. And then I showed the next slide, black screen, white writing, the solution. And it showed two, uh, two girls, Israeli, Palestinian girl playing, holding arms with each other. Two Palestinian, Palestinian Israeli boy walking down the street with arms over each other's shoulder. I go, these kids will never fight each other. You are creating this with your program. And all these programs have to change because the programs we are running are destroying this planet. And uh, it's time for us to, we got to get out of this. Otherwise... It's, it's going to end. Civilizations come and go. It's not the first time. You know, we had uh, the Roman civilization here, gone, okay? We had uh, uh, the monotheistic Judeo-Christian monotheism period. Not here anymore. No, why science, it's actually called materialistic science, has now the new civilization, not new it's since Charlie Darwin, but the new approach. Why? Science disconnected us from the source. Source disconnects us from the reality. Oh, you're a spirit. You don't belong on this planet. You're just here to see if you're okay to go to the place where we think you should go. I go, boy, both of them are wrong. I, you know, I'm like, God damn it, stop it. <laughs> just stop it. Because the point is, we are creators. And I've created a life with knowledge and with the help of my partner of changing any negative program that would come up we had an option. Most people, that's where the fight starts. But what if you knew that there was a program and that the person, the spirit behind that program, that wasn't them. That was a program. Then guess what? You can have a discussion. And then you can say, let's change a program. Then you can change a program. But most people never get that far because they argue. And the person, you know, some, the one, went, rah, 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 and the other person goes, oh, who are you? Where did that come from? And the, you got to remember, the person who just went, blah, blah, blah. they didn't see what they said. It was a program. They were thinking, and the program came out. And then we blamed them. And it's like, they don't even know what the hell they did. What are you, what are you talking about? What did I say? Oh, I said that? <laughs> 
no argument. Right. It's time for communication. Because yeah. I change a program if I see a program, but you cannot see your own program because they only play when you're not paying attention. It's the other people that see the program. But if they're your friend, they don't want to tell you, you know, that was a stupid thing you did. Well, I, you're my friend. What am I going to say? You did stupid? No, you you just ignore it. <laughs> your friends won't tell you when you do stupid things and say stupid things because they're your friends. But they're not really them being the real friends because a real friend would say, geez, you know, it would be better if you look at it this way or something. Right, right. exactly. Well, I want to thank you, and I know all of our comments. Uh, one person wants to move in with you. A couple <laughs> of them do. <laughs> I am enjoying myself. I just had my 80th birthday yesterday. And oh, happy I birthday. Say, 80 is the new to me. I don't even know what the hell age it is. Because it's when a I new 50. Out, when I look out, there's no age when I look out. Right. I look there in isn't. the mirror. So I try not to look in the mirror too much. But the point about it is what? I am not 80 in my consciousness. And the idea is we have a great long life opportunity. It's our programming that, that shortens this life because this functional programming uh, interferes with the telomeres, which give you that long life. It interferes with the metabolism, the chemistry of the body. It does all this stuff, and that's what's controlling your cells. And you'd be very wise to follow this Dr. Connolly right here because her mission is to say, wake up, wake up. Because you don't realize how powerful you are and you see yourself as a victim when in truth you are a creator. Right, you're a miracle 24-7. Absolutely. And you can change anything. Here, cancer people, pay attention right now. A dear friend of mine, her name is Anita Morjani. And you probably heard about her book called Dying to Be Me. Right. I want you to know this woman was four years with an oncologist. And on the last day of her life, she was on a machine because her system wasn't working. And the little cancer lumps were sticking out of her body. And she went into a coma. And a doctor called her family and said, you better come because this is the end. And she had an out-of-body experience. And she met the spirit of her father, who she thought she faulted and lost the love of her father, which then precipitated the, the irritation that led to the cancer. She resolved it with her father. And being out of body, she was given the choice. Do you want to stay here where everything, you feel great? She, her life was great. She left that body on the bed back there. She's up here having a great life. But she saw her husband, Danny, was there holding her hand because he took care of her for four years. And she said, if I don't go back, Danny will get sick. So she said, I'm going back. And she came back out of that out-of-body experience, woke right up. Everybody's like, whoa. And she said, I want some ice cream. And they looked at her, what? And guess what? Two weeks later, the doctors were so feverishly trying to find the cancer. And she said, there is no more cancer. Every bit of that cancer disappeared within that two weeks. And insisting the doctors said, cancer is in there. And they looked and they couldn't find anything. They finally gave up. Why? She changed her consciousness. It was the trauma with her father that caused the self-destruction of that cancer. And when her father told her he never lost love for her, and, that he, he, and he also said something really nice. He said, what happens on earth stays on earth. You don't take it with you when you go outside of there, okay? And guess what? She's the most remarkable, healthy woman today, lecturing. I love to work with her. Going to do some lectures in February with her. Uh, 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 and, and the whole idea about it is what? This woman was on her last day of life, according to her oncologist, running off a machine and woke up with a new consciousness. And within two weeks, no more cancer. I want you to know that because it wasn't somewhere along the cancer path. It was on the last day of cancer that she reversed it. And you should get that book if you don't have it because it's a hell of a read. I call her the poster child for biology of belief. How that belief it came right back in, gone. Thing just changed. Change the belief, cancer gone. 
that's a lesson. She's a teacher. We should all be listening. That is so true. Well, thank you for your incredible time and energy and magical wisdom. And may you be abundantly blessed to share many more episodes with all of us. I would hope so. And I just want people, look, I know I didn't get into the belief change stuff, but guess what? I have a website, simple, brucelipton.com. Under resources, there's information about how to change beliefs. The first problem is everyone's first thought is, it's hard to change a belief. I go, don't even say that, because the moment you said it was hard, you've already implied that the process for you is going to be hard. A belief change can occur in 15 minutes and walk away. And the idea about we must recognize you are powerful and you can rewrite your programs. But you have to know how to activate the record button. Because a lot of people say, I'm going to give myself a good talking to. And I always laugh because I say, well, who are you talking to? Well, I'm talking to my subconscious. I go, there's nobody in the subconscious. It's a hard drive. Programs <laughs> in. <laughs> You're wasting your time talking to the hard drive. There's nobody. Right. <laughs> so true. That's right. No one's listening. <laughs> Oh, well, I tell every day, every day I tell people to go and listen to you. And I said, he will help transform your life. So thank you for everything you do. And thank you for being part of all of our life journey today. Oh, I, I just want to tell you how happy I am that I had this opportunity because I want people who are in the issues to recognize, wait a second, is it real or is this a program? And the answer is a program because you can change that. And when you change it, you become free. And that's what we're here to do. And therefore, I have the deepest appreciation of being asked to even participate with my words of wisdom. <laughs> wow, it's been a privilege for me. Thank you so very much. I so appreciate it, Lee. Thank you so very much. You're welcome, Bruce. And keep in touch. And, and everybody is telling me how much they love you. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank Have you. a good evening. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.